Merry Christmas, everyone. This evening I'll be reading an account of an old-fashioned Christmas from one of America's first popular authors. I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. Washington Irving was born in New York City in 1783 and grew to be one of the most well-known and celebrated American authors of the first half of the 19th century. He is still known for a couple of his stories. One is Rip Van Winkle, and the other is that Halloween classic, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So the story I'm about to read is a chapter in the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, Gent, first published in 1820. It recounts an old-fashioned Christmas day in England in the early 19th century. Let's get started. Christmas Day. When I woke the next morning, it seemed as if all the events of the preceding evening had been a dream, and nothing but the identity of the ancient chamber convinced me of their reality. While I lay musing on my pillow, I heard the sound of little feet pattering outside of the door, and a whispered consultation. Presently, a choir of small voices chanted forth an old Christmas carol, the burden of which was... Rejoice our Savior, he was born on Christmas Day in the morning. I rose softly, slipped on my clothes, opened the door suddenly, and beheld one of the most beautiful little fairy groups that a painter could imagine. It consisted of a boy and two girls, the eldest not more than six, and lovely as seraphs. They were going the rounds of the house and singing at every chamber door, but my sudden appearance frightened them into mute bashfulness. They remained for a moment playing on their lips with their fingers and now and then stealing a shy glance from under their eyebrows until, as if by one impulse, they scampered away and as they turned an angle of the gallery, I heard them laughing in triumph at their escape. Everything conspired to produce kind and happy feelings in this stronghold of old-fashioned hospitality. The window of my chamber looked out upon what in summer would have been a beautiful landscape. There was a sloping lawn, a fine stream winding at the foot of it, and a tract of park beyond, with noble clumps of trees and herds of deer. At a distance was a neat hamlet, with the smoke from the cottage chimneys hanging over it, and a church with its dark spire in strong relief against the clear, cold sky. The house was surrounded with evergreens, according to the English custom, which would have given almost an appearance of summer. But the morning was extremely frosty. The light vapor of the preceding evening had been precipitated by the cold and covered all the trees and every blade of grass with its fine crystallizations. The rays of a bright morning sun had a dazzling effect among the glittering foliage. A robin perched upon the top of a mountain ash that hung its clusters of red berries just before my window was basking its himself in the sunshine and piping a few querulous notes, and a peacock was displaying all the glories of his train and strutting with the pride and gravity of a Spanish grandee on the terrace walk below. I had scarcely dressed myself when a servant appeared to invite me to the family prayers. He showed me the way to a small chapel in the old wing of the house, where I found the principal part of the family already assembled in a kind of gallery furnished with cushions, hassocks, and large prayer books. The servants were seated on the benches below. The old gentleman read prayers from a desk in front of the gallery, and Master Simon acted as clerk and made the responses. And I must do him the justice to say that he acquitted himself with great gravity and decorum. The service was followed by a Christmas carol, which Mr. Bracebridge himself had constructed from a poem of his favorite author, Herrick, and it had been adapted to an old church melody by Master Simon. As there were several good voices among the household, the effect was extremely pleasing, but I was particularly gratified by the exaltation of heart and sudden sally of grateful feeling with which the worthy squire delivered one stanza his eye glistening and his voice rambling out of all the bounds of time and tune. "'Tis thou that crownst my glittering hearth with guiltless mirth, and givest me wassail bowls to drink, 
spice to the brink. Lord, tis thy plenty dropping hand that soils my land, and givest me from my bushel sown twice ten for one. I afterwards understood that early morning service was read on every Sunday and Saint's Day throughout the year, either by Mr. Bracebridge or some member of the family. It was once almost universally the case at the seats of the nobility and gentry of England, and it is much to be regretted that the custom is falling into neglect. For the dullest observer must be sensible of the order and serenity prevalent in those households, where the occasional exercise of a beautiful form of worship in the morning gives, as it were, the keynote to every temper for the day and attunes every spirit to harmony. Our breakfast consisted of what the squire denominated true old English fare. He indulged in some bitter lamentations over modern breakfasts of tea and toast, which, which he censured as among the causes of modern effeminacy and weak nerves and the decline of the old English hardiness. And, though he admitted them to his table to suit the palates of his guests, yet there was a brave display of cold meats, wine, and ale on the sideboard. After breakfast, I walked around the grounds with Frank Bracebridge and Master Simon, or Mr. Simon, as he was called by everybody but the squire. We were escorted by a number of gentlemen-like dogs that seemed loungers about the establishment, from the frisking spaniel to the steady old staghound, the last of which was of a race that had been in the family time out of mind. They were all obedient to a dog whistle which hung to Master Simon's buttonhole and in the midst of their gambols would glance an eye occasionally upon a small switch he carried in his hand. The old mansion had a still more venerable look in the yellow sunshine than by pale moonlight, and I could not but feel the force of the squire's idea that the formal terraces, heavily molded balustrades, and the clipped yew trees carried with them an air of proud aristocracy. There appeared to be an unusual number of peacocks about the place, and I was making some remarks upon what I termed a flock of them that were basking under a sunny wall, when I was gently corrected in my phraseology by Master Simon, who told me that according to the most ancient and approved treatise on hunting, I must say a muster of peacocks. In the same way, added he, with a slight air of pedantry, we say a flight of doves or swallows, a bevy of quails, a herd of deer or wrens or cranes, a skulk of fox, or a building of rooks. He went on to inform me that, according to Sir Anthony Fitzherbert, we ought to ascribe to this bird both understanding and glory, for, being praised, he will presently set up his tail, chiefly against the sun, to the extent that you may better behold the beauty thereof. But at the fall of the leaf, when his tail falleth, he will mourn and hide himself in corners, till his tail come again as it was. I could not help smiling at this display of small erudition on so whimsical a subject, but I found that the peacocks were birds of some consequence at the hall, for Frank Bracebridge informed me that they were great favorites with his father, who was extremely careful to keep up the breed, partly because they belonged to chivalry and were in the great request at the stately banquets of the olden time, and partly because they had a pomp and magnificence about them highly becoming an old family mansion. Nothing, he was accustomed to say, had an air of greater state and dignity than a peacock perched upon an antique stone balustrade. Master Simon had now to hurry off, having an appointment at the parish church with the village um, choristers, who were to perform some music of his selection. There was something extremely agreeable in the cheerful flow of animal spirits of the little man, and I confess I had been somewhat surprised at his apt quotation from authors who certainly were not in the range of everyday reading. I mentioned this last circumstance to Frank Bracebridge, who told me with a smile that Master Simon's whole stock of erudition was confined to some half a dozen old authors, which the squire had put into his hands, and which he read over and over whenever he had a studious fit as he sometimes had on a rainy day or a long winter evening. Sir Anthony Fitzherbert's Book of Husbandry, Markham's Country Contentments, The Treaties of Hunting by Sir Thomas Cockaine, Knight, Isaac Walton's Angler, and two or three more such ancient worthies of the pen were his standard authorities, 
and like all men who know but a few books, he looked up to them with a kind of idolatry and quoted them on all occasions. As to his songs, they were chiefly picked out of old books in the squire's library and adapted to tunes that were popular among the choice spirits of the last century. His practical application of scraps of literature, however, had caused him to be looked upon as a prodigy of book knowledge by all the grooms, huntsmen, and small sportsmen of the neighborhood. While we were talking, we heard the distant toll of a village bell, and I was told that the squire was a little particular in having his household at church on Christmas morning, considering it a day of pouring out of thanks and rejoicing. As old Tusser observed, At Christmas be merry and thankful withal, and feast thy poor neighbors, the great with the small. If you are disposed to go to church, said Frank Bracebridge, I can promise you a specimen of my cousin Simon's musical achievements. As the church is destitute of an organ, he has formed a band from the village amateurs and established a musical club for their improvement. He has also sorted a choir, as he sorted my father's pack of hounds, according to the directions of Gervais Markham and his country contentments. For the bass, he has sought out all the deep, solemn mouths, and for the tenor, the loud, ringing mouths among the country bumpkins, and for sweet mouths, he has culled with curious taste among the prettiest lasses in the neighborhood. Though these last, he affirms, are the most difficult to keep in tune, your pretty female singer being exceedingly wayward and capricious, and very liable to accident. As the morning, though frosty, was remarkably clear and fine, most of the family walked to the church, which was a very old building of gray stone, and stood near a village about half a mile from the park gate. Adjoining it was a low, snug parsonage, which seemed coeval with the church. The front of it was perfectly matted with a yew tree that had been trained against its walls, through the dense foliage of which apertures had been formed to admit light into the small antique lattices. As we passed this sheltered nest, the parson issued forth and preceded us. I had expected to see a sleek, well-conditioned pastor, such as is often found in a snug living in the vicinity of a rich patron's table, but I was disappointed. The parson was a little, meager, black-looking man with a grizzled wig that was too wide and stood off from each ear, so that his head seemed to have shrunk away within it, like a dried filbert in its shell. He wore a rusty coat with great skirts and pockets that would have held the church Bible and prayer book, and his small legs seemed to still smaller from being planted in large shoes decorated with enormous buckles. I was informed by Frank Bracebridge that the parson had been a chum of his father's at Oxford, and had received this living shortly after the latter had come to his, his estate. He was a complete black-letter hunter, and would scarcely read a work printed in the Roman character. The editions of Caxton and Winken de Word were his delight, and he was indefatigable in his researches after such old English writers as have fallen into oblivion from their worthlessness. In deference, perhaps, to the notions of Mr. Bracebridge, he had made diligent investigations into the festive rites and holiday customs of former times, and had been as zealous in the inquiry as if he had been a boon companion. But it was merely with that plodding spirit with which men of a dust temperament follow up any track or of study, merely because it is denominated learning, indifferent to its intrinsic nature, whether it be the illustration of the wisdom or of the ribaldry and obscenity of antiquity. He had pored over these volumes so intensely that they seem to have been reflected into his countenance, which, if the face be indeed an index of the mind, might be compared to the title page of a black letter. On reaching the church porch, we found the parson rebuking the gray-headed sexton for having used mistletoe among the greens with which the church was decorated. It was, he observed, an unholy plant, profaned by having been used by the druids in their mystic ceremonies. And though it might be innocently employed in the festive ornamenting of halls and kitchens, yet it had been deemed by the fathers of the church as unhallowed and totally unfit for sacred purposes. So tenacious was he on this point that the poor sexton was obliged to strip down a great part of the humble trophies of his taste before the parson would consent to enter upon the service of the day. 
The interior of the church was venerable but simple. On the walls were several mural monuments of the Bracebridges, and just beside the altar was a tomb of ancient workmanship, on which lay the effigy of a warrior in armor with his legs crossed, a sign of his having been a crusader. I was told it was one of the family who had signalized himself in the Holy Land, and the same whose picture hung over the fireplace in the hall. During service, Master Simon stood up in the pew and repeated the responses very audibly, evincing that kind of ceremonious devotion punctually observed by a gentleman of the old school and a man of the old family connections. I observed, too, that he turned over the leaves of the folio prayer book with something of a flourish, possibly to show off an enormous seal ring which enriched one of his fingers and which had the look of a family relic. But he was evidently most solicitous about the musical part of the service, keeping his eye fixed intently on the choir and beating time with much gesticulation and emphasis. The orchestra was in a small gallery and presented a most whimsical grouping of heads piled one above the other, among which I particularly noticed that of the village tailor, a pale fellow with a retreating forehead and chin, who played on the clarinet and seemed to have blown his face to a point. And there was another, a short pursy man, stooping and laboring at a bass vial, so as to show nothing but the top of a round bald head like the egg of an ostrich. There were two or three pretty faces among the female singers, to which the keen air of a frosty morning had given a bright rosy tint. But the gentlemen choristers had evidently been chosen, like the old Cremora fiddles, more for tone than looks, and as several had to sing from the same book, there were clustering of odd physiognomies, not unlike those groups of cherubs we see sometimes on country tombstones. The usual services of the choir were managed tolerably well, and the vocal parts generally lagging a little behind the instrumental, and some loitering fiddler now and then making up for lost time by traveling over a passage with prodigious clarity and clearing more bars than the keenest fox hunter to be in at the death. But the great trial was an anthem that had been prepared and arranged by Master Simon, and on which he had founded great expectation. Unluckily, there was a blunder at the very outset. The mu musicians became flustered. Master Simon was in a fever. Everything went on lamely and irregularly until they came to a chorus beginning, Now let us sing with one accord, which seemed to be a signal for parting company. All became discord and confusion. Each shifted for himself and got to the end as well, or rather as soon as he could, excepting one old chorister in a pair of horn spectacles, bestriding and pinching a long, sonorous nose, who happened to stand a little apart, and being wrapped up in his own melody, kept on a quavering course, wriggling his head, ogling his book, and winding up all by a nasal solo of at least three bars duration. The parson gave us a most erudite sermon on the rites and ceremonies of Christmas, and the propriety of observing it not merely as a day of thanksgiving, but of rejoicing, supporting the correctness of his opinions by the earliest usages of the church, and enforcing them by the authorities of Theophilus of Caesarea, St. Cyprian, St. Christosom, St. Augustine, and a cloud more of saints and fathers, from whom he made copious quotations. I was a little at a loss to perceive the necessity of such a mighty array of forces to maintain a point which no one present seemed inclined to dispute, but I soon found that the good man had a legion of ideal adversaries to contend with, having in the course of his researches on the subject of Christmas got completely embroiled in the sectarian controversies of the Revolution, when the Puritans made such a fierce assault upon the ceremonies of the church and poor old Christmas was driven out of the land by proclamation of Parliament. The worthy parson lived but with times past, and knew but little of the present. Shut up among the worm-eaten tomes in the retirement of his antiquated little study, the pages of old times were to him as the gazettes of the day, while the era of the Revolution was mere modern history. He forgot that nearly two centuries had elapsed since the fiery persecution of poor mince pie throughout the land, when plum porridge was denounced as mere popery and roast beef as anti-Christian, 
and that Christmas had been brought in again triumphantly with the merry court of King Charles at the Restoration. He kindled into warmth with the ardor of his contest and the host of imaginary foes with whom he had to combat. He had a stubborn conflict with old Prynne and two or three other forgotten champions of the Roundheads on the subject of Christmas festivity, and concluded by urging his hearers in the most solemn and affecting manner to stand to the traditional customs of their fathers and feast and make merry on this joyous anniversary of the church. I've seldom known a sermon attended apparently with more immediate effects, for on leaving the church, the congregation seemed one and all possessed with the gaiety of spirit so earnestly enjoined by their pastor. The elder folks gathered in knots in the churchyard, greeting and shaking hands, and the children ran about crying, Yule, Yule, and repeating some uncouth rhymes, which the parson who had joined us informed me had been handed down from days of yore. The villagers doffed their hats to the squire as he passed, giving him good wishes of the season with every appearance of heartfelt sincerity, and were invited by him to the hall to take something to keep out the cold of the weather, and I heard blessings uttered by several of the poor, which convinced me that, in the midst of his enjoyments, the worthy old cavalier had not forgotten the true Christmas virtue of charity. On our way homeward, his heart seemed overflowed with generous and happy feelings. As we passed over a rising ground which commanded something of a prospect, the sounds of rustic merriment now and then reached our ears. The squire paused for a few moments and looked around with an air of inexpressible benignity. The beauty of the day was of itself sufficient to inspire philanthropy. Notwithstanding the frostiness of the morning, the sun in his cloudless journey had acquired sufficient power to melt away the thin covering of snow from every southern declivity and to bring out the living green which adorns an English landscape even in midwinter. Large tracts of smiling verdure contrasted with the dazzling whiteness of the faded slopes and hollows. Every sheltered bank on which the broad rays rested yielded its silver rill of cold and limpid water, glittering through the dripping grass, and sent up slight exhalations to contribute to the thin haze that hung just above the surface of the earth. There was something truly cheering in this triumph of warmth and verdure over the frosty thraldom of winter. It was, as the squire observed, an emblem of Christmas hospitality breaking through the chills of ceremony and selfishness and thawing every heart into a flow. He pointed with pleasure to the indications of good cheers reeking from the chimneys of the comfortable farmhouses and low thatched cottages. I love, said he, to see this day well kept by rich and poor. It is a great thing to have one day in the year at least, when you are sure of being welcome wherever you go, and of having, as it were, the world all thrown open to you. And I am almost disposed to join with poor Robin in his malediction on every churlish enemy to this honest festival. Those who at Christmas do repine, and would fain hence dispatch him, May they with old Duke Humphrey dine, or else may squire catch catch em. The squire went on to lament the deplorable decay of the games and amusements which were once prevalent at this season among the lower orders and countenanced by the higher, when the old halls of castles and manor houses were thrown open at daylight, when the tables were covered with brawn and beef and humming ale, when the harp and the carol resounded all day long, and when rich and poor were alike welcome to enter and make merry. Our old games and local customs, said he, had a great effect in making the peasant fond of his home, and the promotion of them by the gentry made him fond of his lord. They made the times merrier and kinder and better, and I can truly say with one of our old poets, I like them well, the curious preciseness and all pretended gravity of those that seek to banish hence these harmless sports, have thrust away much ancient honesty. The nation, continued here, is altered. We have almost lost our simple, true-hearted peasantry. They have broken asunder from the higher classes and seem to think their interests are separate. They have become too knowing and begin to read newspapers, listen to alehouse politicians, and talk of reform. 
I think one mode to keep them in good humor in these hard times would be for the nobility and gentry to pass more time on their estates, mingle more among the country people, and set the merry old English games going again. Such was the good squire's project for mitigating public discontent. And indeed, he had once attempted to put his doctrine in practice, and a few years before had kept open house during the holidays in the old style. The country people, however, did not understand how to play their parts in the scene of hospitality. Many uncouth circumstances occurred. The manor was overrun by all the vagrants in the country, and more beggars drawn into the neighborhood in one week than the parish officers could get rid of in a year. Since then, he had contented himself with inviting the decent part of the neighboring peasantry to call at the hall on Christmas Day, and with distributing beef and bread and ale among the poor, that they might make merry in their own dwellings. We had not been long home when the sound of music was heard at a distance. A band of country lads, without coats, their shirt sleeves fancifully tied with ribbons, their hats decorated with greens, and clubs in their hands, was seen advancing up the avenue, followed by a large number of villagers and peasantry. They stopped before the hall door, where the music struck up, struck up a peculiar air, and the lads performed a curious and intricate dance, advancing, retreating, and striking their clubs together, keeping exact time to the music, while one, whimsically crowned with a fox's skin, the tail of which flaunted down his back, kept capering around the skirts of the dance and rattling a Christmas box with many antic gesticulations. The squire eyed this fanciful exhibition with great interest and delight, and gave me a full account of its origin, which he traced to the times when the Romans held possessions of the island, plainly proving that this was a lineal descent of the sword dance of the ancients. It was now, he said, nearly extinct, but he had accidentally met with traces of it in the neighborhood, and it encouraged its revival, though, to tell the truth, it was too apt to be followed by the rough, rough cudgel play and broken heads in the evening. After the dance was concluded, the whole party was entertained with brawn and beef and stout home-brewed. The squire himself mingled among the rustics and was received with awkward demonstrations of deference and regard. It is true I perceived two or three of the younger peasants, as they were raising their tankards to their mouths, when the squire's back was turned, making something of a grimace, and pulling each other the wink. But the moment they caught my eye, they pulled grave faces were an exceedingly demure. With Master Simon, however, they all seemed more at ease. His varied occupations and amusements had made him well known throughout the neighborhood. He was a visitor at every farmhouse and cottage, gossiped with the farmers and their wives, romped with their daughters, and like a type of vagrant bachelor, the humble bee, toiled the sweets from all the rosy lips of the country round. The bashfulness of the guests soon gave way before good cheers and affability. There is something genuine and affectionate in the gaiety of the lower orders when it is excited by the bounty and familiarity of those above them. The warm glow of gratitude enters into their mirth, and a kind word or a small pleasantry frankly uttered by a patron gladden the heart of the dependent more than oil and wine. When the squire had retired, the merriment increased, and there was much joking and laughter, particularly between Master Simon and a hale, ruddy-faced, white-headed farmer who appeared to be the wit of the village, for I observed all his companions to wait with open mouths for his retorts and burst into gratuitous laugh before they could well understand them. The whole house indeed seemed abandoned to merriment, as I passed to my room to dress for dinner, I heard the sound of music in a small court, and looking through a window that commanded it, I perceived a band of wandering musicians with pandean pipes and tambourine. A pretty coquettish housemaid was dancing a jig with a smart country lad, while several of the other servants were looking on. In the midst of her sport, the girl caught a glimpse of my face at the window, and, coloring up, ran off with an air of roguish, affected confusion. The end. Thank you so much for joining me for this Christmas edition of Reading Aloud. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and a great rest of the week.